episode 146 hella black you know what i'm saying appreciate everybody who's been tapping into the past episodes appreciate everyone who tapped into episode 145 you feel me tap in with all of them you feel me we got a lot of good content you know what i'm saying and just like a book could be reread and re-listened to you know what i'm saying so tap in go to our patreon patreon.com slash hella black pod our soundcloud spotify apple Podcasts, wherever you stream your podcast that we is at you feel me but we need that support. We need that real support, you know. So if you're driving right now, pull over and sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. Feel me? Support the people. You know what I'm saying? We got a great episode in store with us, with y'all, for y'all today. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we got Brother Darius here with us. You know, for those of you who don't know, he's a esteemed poet, organizer here with us at People's Programs and uh uh, we're very excited to to have him on this podcast and really uh, just talk that talk. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so Darius, how you doing? Cool, man. Excited to be here. Appreciate y'all for having me. Oh, that's it's dope. Excited to talk that talk. <laughs> Did you ever think, you know, we was going to be on a podcast together when you uh, first heard about people's programs or first heard about stuff uh, maybe on Twitter or something? Nah, nah, not at all. Especially just seeing y'all before pulling up to people's programs, just seeing y'all as like Twitter figures and people that I was following. <laughs> Definitely Twitter figures. About being on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter, Twitter figures, Twitter fingers, you know what I'm saying? But hey, <laughs> we long here. time coming for sure. <laughs> long time coming. Yeah. How you feeling today? I'm cool. You know, caffeinated. Um, got out to water my plants today. Today was a watering day, so I always feel a little a little calmer, a little clearer on those days. Yeah, them plants gonna need that water today, especially with this heat that's been uh coming through. This 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 late summer we having right now. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I just want to tell people who might not know, especially if you're dealing with like plants at the crib, outdoor plants, you either water your plants early in the morning before the sun comes out or late at night when the sun's going down. Do not water your plants in the middle of the day. They will get burned. Free game. Mm-hmm. They will yeah. be burned. Free game. Burn and you know it's depending on how much you water and the water might just evaporate. So yeah, want to water early on later in the day. Come on, farming tips. Come on, you know I got it, baby green thumb. But before we get into it, I know Boss has spoken a little bit about your background, but uh, you can give us some more insight into you know who you are, what you do, uh, and your role at People's Programs. For sure. Um, so my name is Darius. I'm a poet organizer with people's programs. I'm a member of the central committee and the land team, so our people's farm. Uh, essentially what that means is facilitating work days where folks come out, pull up, uh, making sure that uh, the crops stay alive in between those days. Uh, and really just working with the land to build, you know, a more positive relationship with it so that we can turn out as many crops as possible, but also uh, build up our skills for, you know, sovereignty and independence on the land. And then, you know, supporting all, all programs that I can. People's program started off with People's Breakfast Oakland, but pretty much, you know, whatever program I can pull up to. And then. Yeah, my boy be doing some good work. Some really good work. Yeah, bro, it's been uh, dope to see uh, your process, you know what I'm saying? From uh, coming to community learnings to volunteering to becoming a member to now becoming a a uh, part of the central committee, you know what I'm saying? You've definitely put in a lot of work and you're someone who I, I, I definitely uh, early on had respect for just based off of how you just kept showing up and working, working and sweating, you know what I'm saying? So uh, <laughs> it's definitely dope, uh, you know what I'm saying, to witness your growth in a certain type of way, you know what I'm saying, from the outside looking in and then obviously now developing a, a more of a, a comrade relationship, you know what I'm saying, over the years. Uh, but it's a question that I think I get in that people genuinely get kind of a lot sometimes is like, did you have this moment where you first felt like you got political or did you have like a certain defining moment that happened in your life where you're like, ah, nah, this, this has got to change. You know what I'm saying? I got to do something. You feel me? Did you have like a moment like that or? Yeah, it was really a couple and they happened in like within three years of each other, something like that. There was, there was a woman, I went uh, I went to school in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. And there was a district that was right next to a, a black district. And it was, of course, separated by a highway. So I was in this mostly white district. 
And it gotten to the point where our school was offering like $100 per person to snitch on other people to, that didn't live in a district. So really seeing some of my closest friends get kicked out to, um, you know, the district next door and essentially like dissolving those relationships. But there was a woman, a mother named uh, Kelly Williams Bolar, and she had sent her elementary school kids to our district. And she was using her grandparents' address. Now, her grandparents live in the district, but, you know, she didn't. And she had sent her kids over, and they found her out. And they, you know, put her in jail and was trying to hit her with a felony. And so my mom was a part of National Action Network at the time, Al Sharpton's thing. And so, you know, she called in. They, they came out, made the, the big hoorah and all of that. Um, but my mom had asked me to write a piece for that. Before then, I was writing, you know, I was very much on the the – you know, the whole tip kick of, you know, we was kings and queens reading very little, but having, you know, I found out about Egypt and was like, gas, you know, we came from royal. <laughs> so what, you, you, you tell me you ain't a king, my brother? <laughs> nah, nah, brother. <laughs> hey, man, someone, someone said one time, you know, uh, we don't associate with that kingdom stuff because it was in kings and queens that were selling us off. And that's Come why on. we are where we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, put me, well, put uh, me with the peasants. What age group was this? Or what age you was in high school? Or yeah, I was a junior in high school, and yeah, but at at that point it was like I had to search, uh, like information about what was going on, um, and not just be off of like feeling vibes. Mm -hmm. And so I was like looking up the laws in Ohio and stuff like that, and I came to realize that there was a system at play. You know, before it was like this condition sucks, we got to do better and stuff like that. But that was really the first time that I came to see like this system playing out and impacting this individual person. But really, you know, like I said, I saw my friends being, being impacted by it too. So really having an awareness of there's something else going on, even if I couldn't articulate it. So that and was of one. course after that, okay. you said what? Yeah, so that was one, uh, what, what was going yeah, yeah. on in your district? And then you say you had yeah, two yeah. more? Yeah, so that was like 2010, 2011. Then I'm in college, 2012, and Trayvon Martin is murdered. And so, like, our, our local NAACP, our campus NAACP did, a, you know, a bunch of stuff. And that was my first time going through a march. And, um, you know, hearing people talk about what was happening and putting it into more of a, a historical context, not, you know, a real one or a real helpful one, but saying this, is, this has got to stop type stuff. So I was in, when Mike Brown was murdered, I was the president of a poetry org on campus. And so when they, like, got together as leaders of organizations, I was at the table with, like, the leader from BSU leaders from NAACP and all of that. And one of the first things they said was that uh, this wasn't about race. And so whatever we needed to do, whatever we were going to do, we shouldn't make it about race. And I was kind of like, kind of pushed me away from whatever, whatever sort of pre-established. NAACP said that? Yeah, somebody from NAACP. And it was like the canvas NAACP. So it's not like the national chapter, yeah. but it's not, not really a difference, but. Yeah, I mean, shoot, the NAACP out here was having pro police yeah, yeah, protests yeah, yeah. in front of the courthouse. <laughs> yeah, Du Bois somewhere sick. Man, that's what the boys <laughs> rolling the out. Out. Man, Come on. <laughs> they said the National that's... Association for certain people. <laughs> I'm weak. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. But yeah, man, that was that was pretty much my like uh, my 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 trajectory into really having to figure out what was going on and what I wanted to do about it. So like I left that room and started, you know, paying more attention to what was happening in Ferguson and what people were doing, because it was like, you know, I saw the people around me was essentially on bullshit. And so it was like, you know, what, what are people doing nationally? And I saw, you know, the, uh, the Ferguson frontline folks really getting active. So it was like, you know, I need to tap in with them. Mm -hmm. So me and a friend just went out there, you know, tapped in with lost voices. It was a group that was like marching day in and day out in Ferguson, you know, camera crews or not um and you know really keeping the energy moving and so we talked to them and i asked them a simple question i was like you know what can we do you know we're going back to michigan you know a couple of days we're trying to um support y'all and like you know really make this thing pop um and they said take this back you know look at what we're doing go back home and get active and so like that from there started you know moving into uh a confrontational relationship with the condition and so confrontations with uh, campus pig with administration and all that, all with an effort to like, you know, really change what was going on. Because folks have been complaining about, you know, black students in our condition there for as long as I've been a freshman. But I'll say those three moments for sure. I feel that for sure. Uh, I remember Tef Poe, who's from Ferguson, who was uh, doing a lot of like work up there. He came to Cal 
And I was a student. He's like, what y'all doing? Y'all here in Berkeley, y'all got to do something. <laughs> you know, so I definitely uh, resonate a lot with that. That's good. In the past, uh, you've spoken a little bit to uh, how coming to uh, people's programs, community learning sessions, had played a role in uh, helping politicize you and giving you some of that analysis. Can you talk a little bit more about that process and what it's been like now that you've gone from like community learnings through the membership process uh, to now? Uh, leading certain cadre sessions for PE as well. For sure. I really hadn't even considered that. We, you know, you know, coming from that first community learning, but um, in 2020 came to the first people's programs, uh, community learning. And what I remember is just seeing folks, you know, for lack of a better phrase, talking that talk. I had seen, you know, speeches from people before and, you know, people I, I admired. And I was like, huh, this sounds good. You know, they're funny, but I had never really heard an analysis of the condition and especially not a a suggestion of what could be done about it, including me, especially. Right. And so like folks like Mark Lamont Hill, I like come to my campus and, you know, I've seen these public figures saying, you know, this is uh, an issue and all of that. And so um, at the community learning, what stood out to me was that um, there was a very clear, uh, very, you know, uh, succinct and research analysis of what was happening in, in Oakland. Um, how it connected to history, but also what I could do immediately after. And so I, at the end of the uh, the event, there was a book list. And I was like, bet. Like, I, I had never seen folks, you know, talking like that um, say less. You know, I, I need to read books. Before then, you know, I, I really didn't have a relationship to, to reading or study. Um, and so, like, went to the bookstore immediately after. I think it was Mo's books and Revolution books and grabbed the Sada, Revolutionary Suicide, Writings on the Wall by Mumia, We Want Freedom. And I think that was it for that, that first grab. Um, I really get, got into reading. I didn't start pulling up to people's programs until some months later. But, you know, immediately after, uh, pretty much maybe a month later, I read Asada. And my whole, you know, my whole perspective shifted. And I just realized how much I didn't know and that I couldn't really be um, who I was before or how I was before, which is not a reader. I was talking to somebody like two days ago. And they were comparing themselves to me and they were saying, you know, I don't really have the years and years of reading. And I had to correct them. I was like, bro, I started reading in 2020. I don't That's know crazy, how bro, because I would have thought like. you started reading like way before that. That's wild to hear. I don't know if you told me this before, but yeah, I for sure picked you. Yeah, and I remember when you told me this, I was like, I'm like, all right, it's proof. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's proof that, because you, I remember you telling me the story, Darius. I'm like, okay, you came to the community. But, but before that, I was like, okay, I figured you was doing some reading. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure, and they're like, nah, I wasn't really real. I'm like, okay. That's that poetry. Bet. You got to watch out for them niggas. They got away with words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, thing. That's the wild thing. I had been speaking in front of people on stages for so long and was not reading a book. It was terribly <laughs> irresponsible. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's the industry. But yeah, the y'all see the when we on Zoom and stuff, y'all see the books behind me. I had nothing in books before 2020. And so, you be you be really like working them books up too. You feel me? Hell with notes in it, hell with uh well, you know, page dividers, color coordinated yeah. stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, all right, you feel me? Like <laughs> I got to, man. I'm a visual learner. So if I don't like engage with it in that way, I'm gonna forget whatever, whatever I just read. Man, um, I know we have a question later on down the line around uh, the importance of joining organizations, but I think what's coming to my mind right now, as we talk about your, uh, I guess like your pathway to growth and uh, participation in, in the organization, I think that specifically contradicts some of the uh, national discourse around not joining organizations or organizations not working. I guess, could hey. you speak a little bit to that what's been your experience yeah i man, um i think on the the reading to there's just it's just been helpful to because i'm action oriented like i described earlier it was just like what can i do what can i do in all of those those situations um and so what has been helpful is that this study is not in isolation from action and so from jump there was a, even the community learning, it was like, we're here gathering, organizing, and here's this, this book list. And so the theory and action and theory and practice going hand in hand is essential just for me and how I am. Um, but I know that it's also been helpful to see other people struggling, other people learning, other people reading, um, and to engage in that process collectively just on some, you know, like this is, this is easier done as a group, easier digested, especially 
going through Fanon and, you know, other uh, uh, heavy texts like that. But outside of that, to see people committing themselves to the same ideology, the same objectives, the same goals, and to then to engage that process on a personal level is um clarifying i think that's the the best word for it because without that say we didn't have the action and we was just a book club or say we had all of the action but didn't have you know this this study that was going on and people allowing themselves to change through the process i think that change would be um interrupted it would be uh much less impactful um w- without either of those things and so what i've seen over the years is is people who are committed um who are ever changing um and who are, uh, you know, active, you know, and getting into books, getting into um, organizing, getting into action. So it's been, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to, <clears throat> how to how to come at the question because I feel like I've, I've changed so drastically, not just from reading books, but um, understanding the necessity of it, you know, humility, you know, my confidence is, is shifted because I come to understand myself as a part of a, a collective and I can't be out here talking about you know, the people have the capacity to change the people, this, the people that, and not understand myself as a part of that process, right? And so I've had to change how I see myself, how I talk to myself, because I wouldn't talk to, you know, my neighbors like that. I wouldn't talk to my comrades like that. And so I think even having that that mirror and having those those folks that are linked arms with you in this process of change and not just monotonous work that is repetitive is essential. So when we're talking about organizing, we're talking about change, we're talking about a protracted thing, uh, we're talking about a changing thing, and I think without either theory, without an organization to house that change, to house that process, um, it's a it's a loss. You, yeah. you, I just got one more follow up question. You mentioned like humility, and I wonder what role like humility and patience have played uh, in your ability to give the organization time to grow as well as give yourself time to grow. Because uh, a lot of the discourse that I see really. Well, I mean, we spend a lot of time on college campuses, you know, talking to different uh, groups and then also seeing the discourse online. But it seems like a lot of people suffer from a a, a lack of patience with individuals and a lack of patience with the collective. So what role has, you know, like mm-hmm. humility and patience uh, played in your ability to engage in, you know, three years of three going on, four years of, of building one people's programs? For sure. I would say... <clears throat> I would say that there are people that I know who were really organized and they were really harmed in some, some terrible ways in the, the past couple of years and the failures of movements. And there is much more um, of what you talked about, which is impatience and folks pulling up to organizations, expecting them to be ready made, expecting them to be, you know, the perfect solution to their problems, as opposed to seeing that, you know, you have that you have to be, I hate the phrase really, but be the change you want to see. But seeing themselves as part of that process. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's taken a, I think the first step is trust um, in the organization, the people leading the org, because if you don't, you know, fake that or have that from jump, when you come to make suggestions or you come to see the failures of an org, as soon as you pull up, you might, you know, discount that or you might uh, attribute that to something broader. Oh, this is just because there are this group of people leading or this is just another example of them people, you know what I mean? Like that type mm-hmm. of stuff. And so um, having to have like space, patience and humility and seeing myself too, like, you know, I, that at least they are outside doing the thing at the very least. I think for me pulling up whatever thoughts I had, whatever critiques I had, it was like, well, shit that, you know, they've been doing this thing for a minute, which isn't to discount me, but they clearly have something to offer. And I think that I might have a critique. I might have a, an idea. That means I have something to offer too. And neither of us, for our gaps and for our lack of the other thing is uh is less than. Um, so that's been a part of it. Patience is essential. And I think studying history has been helpful in that and seeing that um what what fed, what has led people to like breaking off and starting other orgs rather than strengthening other organizations, what has led folks to, you know, uh canceling <laughs> for for lack of a better word, or you know, throwing folks away has been a uh, disengaging and struggle with each other and I think that's the that's the most uncomfortable process for people to step to and say like I think this this is what's happening you know how can we you know address this or maybe this idea that I'm having uh it, it, is, it isn't time for this there's a different phase of struggle that this idea is for or y'all didn't already tried that you know that type of stuff and being open to the fact that either it was already tried 
if it's a good idea and if solid and resources are there, it'll be implemented. And that the folks that that have gaps that are, uh, you know, maybe failing in whatever ways that you might see, they're humans, you know. But and in this society, this capitalist society, nine times out of ten, working multiple jobs and still trying to organize. And so, seeing them as human and you know yourself as a human in the process, then everybody's ability to change in that is essential. Yeah. You know, I think that's important because I think a lot of times people come into organizing spaces and I mean, like Jaleel was saying, uh, we are on liberators, especially with like sometimes like students, like students will come in uh, oftentimes with some type of Marxist one in this background and uh, have this understanding. Like, oh, I know it all and not being humble and patient is at the same time. You know, so I think that's an important point you brought up is like just being a uh, having trust, being humble uh, and having patience, you know, and I think for you, you give a good example uh, I think to organizers in general around the country, but especially like within our cadre, because like you were saying, you came in at 2020, not reading, you came to a community learning, not reading, not really engaged. And then within, you know, three years rose from a volunteer to a member to a central committee and someone who was dedicating, you know, was studying a lot, you know? So I think you give a good example of like, uh, like what trust, patience and humility and a commitment looks like you know so i think uh people in our cadre can learn a lot from that uh, hell yeah and a lot of people i i i would again if we know how uh, economic systems um tend to supersede ideology or be connected to ideology um this very individualistic and uh i guess that this individualistic and this backward negative system of capitalism uh, creates that type of ideology in us to where we go into organizing spaces and some of the times the first thing we look for is like what a person is doing wrong what a group is doing wrong or when an individual comes in the first thing we look at is what the individual is doing wrong versus uh yeah, i guess being having that mindset of like let me give things time to figure out what's going on to make more sense why does this person act this way why does the organization operate this way and if we can all come in with a little bit more pay a little bit more patience uh a lot of these um, personal problems that tend to be mass as political problems will be alleviated and be eradicated. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, yeah. But again, this is a system that definitely doesn't want you to feel, definitely doesn't want you to feel patient or be patient, exhibit patience. Um, and then you talked about making mistakes. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. Like a lot of folks, their work can't be criticized because they don't have any work to criticize. You ain't doing nothing. Mm. So of course you come to us, you're going to come into a meeting, you spend a month with us, you're going to be able to point out all the things we some holes in our shit is because we doing so much. Right. Uh, but I think about a quote from Ho Chi Minh. He says, only idle people do not make mistakes, but I'd rather make mistakes by practicing than by doing nothing. And Straight up, nigga. That's how I like to move through people's programs. Straight up. Right. So, you know, now we're transitioning a little bit, you know, you're talking about, you know, poetry, man, being a poet, man. Uh, so for those of y'all don't know, Darius got a book out. Y'all definitely got to tap in Darius. Where can uh, you get that book? Uh, buttonpoetry.com but also you know wherever you get your books go to bookshop.org anywhere else Wait, I was in. just making sure you plug that because you know people's first thing usually is going straight to Amazon <laughs> All right on. so uh, I want to give people that uh, that direct direct link you know but can you talk about uh, when you first got into poetry uh, and also you know how your writing uh, has evolved over these years and uh, how your poetry has evolved over these years for sure. So I first got into poetry in like fourth grade. There was a poetry unit, uh, like Mrs. Croft's class. Uh, normally, my mom got called in for all types of class clownery, but I did really good on this poetry project. And so she called my mom in and was like, she showed her the little, little booklet. I was like, this, this thing, have him keep doing this. Um, and so my mom was really on me from there to to keep writing and keep expressing myself in that way. So you was a so class like, clown slash poet. That was your fourth grade. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poet, my poet was a, a reformed class clown. <laughs> found poetry. Uh, and then like high, middle school, I would say I was writing a lot of poems for like family, for my mom, and grandma, writing love notes and stuff like that. And then started to, to write about uh, emotions that were coming up and trying to make sense of, of things. I think still what's true to this day is that poetry is where I express myself the the smoothest. I think that I'm most uh, clear when I'm writing a poem about a thing, where there's something that I think or something that I feel. 
So in like middle school, it was really just clarifying those emotions, things that were going on in the home, stuff like that. High school, being a part of this uh, mentor organization that kind of introduced me to uh, my blackness in some form, I started writing more things about that. And so, you know, I was definitely on, like I said, hotel tip, the, uh, we got to stop killing ourselves. And, you know, we, we are better than this type stuff and start, started writing in that way. Um, Some of that is true, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like, I, I think I'm, I mock the voice because the voice is what, you know, the, the caricature of it, where like, that's, that's the only side that's being told. It's, yeah. it's a lot more complicated. You missed the whole analysis. That, you know? Yeah, that ain't analysis. Mm-hmm. That's a fact, but it's not. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Um, so and then in, you know in college kind of both of those things came to play started doing spoken word uh, poetry slams stuff like that got more into performance and yeah the content pretty much stayed the same writing out feelings writing out you know the things that I'm seeing going on in the world I would say that my poetry really didn't come with an analysis until I had one which is you know true of art overall I think sometimes we can think about trying to project ourselves into having a perspective in a, in a particular piece of work, but it's really just a reflection of who you are and what you're doing. Um, and so until I really started to read books that, you know, my, my poems pretty much centered on the things that were wrong and the things that were happening to us and how, how bad it hurt. Right. And I really didn't have any sort of solutions until I started to understand that there were some stuff. So I started engaging with uh, people's programs. And so I would say the a major shift in the past couple of years has been, you know, my writing, both in clarifying my enemies, clarifying, um, who my people are and clarifying like what what can be done, what might could be done with our condition and situation rather than just writing um, pieces that detail the struggle, which is important in detail, like what's happening to us, like that kind of reporting, that kind of uh, art is super necessary. And it's important for us to be able to articulate what else there is, you know, to both humanize our people and humanize the oppressor. Like these folks are just folks with addresses, um, blood flowing through their veins, and folks who making decisions and they too, you know, have a mortality. This this system and the people facilitating it have, have mortality. Can you give us an example of a well, give us an example, but also speak to the importance of uh poets being parts of movements rather than doing that which you just claimed, right? Observing uh from a distance. For sure. I would say uh, an exemplary example of this is Amiri Baraka. Um Going back to what we were talking about earlier with humanity and patience, going through his life, you read his autobiography, you read his collections of essays, even his poems, you'll see some problematic stuff come up through there. What you'll also see is his commitment to organization. You know, he, he was never just saying this is what should happen. He was outside with people, you know, and so he was building up the thing at the same time he was talking about it. And he faced the consequences for doing that thing, too. Um, and so we're talking about the Black Arts Preparatory Theater, um, the Black United Front. Eventually, the Republic of New Africa, um, you know, all, all types of collectives and organizations. That's not even counting, you know, the the little coalitions and different Black Power conferences that popped up. Uh, you know, he he was a part of. This is a great example because um, without step into those organizations, like I said earlier, all we have is uh, an individualized or maybe even collective expression of the pain. I can't say what there is to be done if I'm not actively involved. You know, I might get off into some dogmatic, this is what we should do, you know, type stuff from a theoretical text or from a book. But if I'm not tapped in with the material organization that is active, that is doing the thing, what I suggest to other people or even my analysis of what's happening is limited and, you know, possibly even outright false. So it's a, it's a hell important to, to be tapped in and be pulling up. Um, because art has a, um, let me see. Art has a power, mm-hmm. power to translate, a power to inspire, a power to inform. The state understand, understands this and knows this and engages in this. So we're talking about the creation of the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, the, the money that's go, that goes into propaganda with the pig shows, military industrial complex movies, all of this stuff. And so at, at, at all times, we're being inundated with these, these images and this propaganda and this art from the state, even if we don't recognize it as art from the state. I was singing a song like uh two weeks ago that I haven't heard since I was 10 years old. That's that's some effective art, some effective propaganda. Um and so like we, you know, we really have to be creating this counter thing so that we have something sustainable and so that we can um like I said, really be tapped into to the solutions and to what's next. I'm gonna send you um 
Well, I don't actually have the. I'm gonna see if I can find the PDF, but there's like some essays from a uh, Ho Chi Minh that I will send you, where he's giving feedback to different writers. Um, I want to say in Vietnam, but he was also, I think he was in like the French Communist Party and shit. Like he's bounced around as it pertains to uh, like international uh, anti-imperialist movement. So I can't tell you exactly what, uh, who he's writing to at the time, but he has a lot of feedback on um, art, propaganda, especially around writing, mm -hmm. right? Um, he says, a sober, concise style prevails over an em emphatic one. Um, if your writing is to be, if your writing is intended to be propaganda, it must be understood by all. Uh, and then mm -hmm. my favorite one is the the magnificence of our expressions very often conceal the confusion of our ideas. And so I'm gonna More. send you this shit because I think I think you'll fuck with it. Oh yeah, Thomas Sankara did a. He has I think my favorite quote about the role or responsibility of artists. You know, artists like to quote Nina Simone and you know say that. Our, our responsibility is to reflect the times, but they kind of skip over the ones that really tell us we need to be doing something. And then Thomas Sankara said that if we writing for people, then people need to know we writing about them essentially and saying that writer's responsibility and role is to be tapped into the, the desires, the dreams of the masses of people that they claim to be writing for. And so like, before you say you're writing for a community, do them folks know you? Do they know who you are? And can they can they ingest your work? That's an important mm -hmm. question. Straight up, straight up. Uh, how has being a member, you know, in people's programs affected uh, your poetry? The show. I can give a specific example, but we'll say that, that the entire third section, I don't know if I told you this, but the entire third section of the book is really um, from pulling up to people, people's programs. Um, there was a poem, Capital, Capital. I think that was the first, that might have been the first or second poem that got contributed to the little pamphlets that we used to put out mm -hmm. um and it was the invitation to write something for people's programs that had me questioning my style of writing and what i was writing about um and it pretty much shifted and created that that entire third section of the book but um the way that it shifted and changed is that i started to really look outside um and to really take account of what was happening and to who not just Think about thinking about myself as a black person and everything that I say and speak is then for black people because I, you know, I, I, I identify with them. But like, really, what is the condition of, you know, new Africans in Oakland, you know, houses folks in Oakland um, and what was going on? And I, I felt a responsibility to, to kind of accurately reflect in that way, in a way that I hadn't before. And so it kind of I, I don't really know what how to name the process. It was, it was like a new muscle getting flexed or a, a different perspective on writing and its usefulness because you can't really write propaganda if you're not tapped in with an organization and prior to then i hadn't seen myself really as a part of a thing writing you know for for a particular purpose besides my perspective and so uh, people's programs really allowed for me to put my poetry to use in a way that i think is most effective again art as a part of an organization even if everything that i write isn't essentially utilized by people's programs being a member now um you know now i am a a billboard for the organization a bill, billboard for the ideology and the politic and so um being able to take it out in that way has a has a different weight carried with it and so the analysis that I, that we have in um you know the political ground in circles and the the pe events and all of that um comes through either naturally because I've been studying or because that's who I am now or because I feel a responsibility to be, you know, propagandizing and agitating people to let them know this is, you know, the complicated nature of what's going on. This is what an election means and what it doesn't mean. This is what a former president being arrested means and what it doesn't mean for the most uh, vulnerable of our people. Hell yeah. We've spoken about it a little bit um, throughout the, you know, pod, but can you give you know, uh, specific advice to a person who is looking to join, you know, a revolutionary organization? For sure. I would say if you're looking for a revolutionary org and, you, you know, you come across one that you think might be it, see what their program is. I think any any organization claiming to be a revolutionary organization has to have a strategy for right now as in this is what we're up to, this is what we're doing, not what we think, but like what we're doing right now. And this is how this it contributes overall to our goals. And so this is what is happening at this stage as we continue 
these are the things that we have set out for ourselves. It's important to dissect jargon, you know, um, these these words of like anti-imperialist and, you know, even words, phrases like the masses and, um, you know, all this other this other stuff. They can say, say the words, say the words liberation and sovereignty and all that. The question should be, what are they doing? You know, what is how does that attach to the goals overall? I would say also that um, there's got to be a a process for change, both for the organization. And so, like, if you if it's an organization that has 10, 15 years in the game, you could be asking yourself, what is what has changed over time? Are they still doing that same that same thing they was doing 10 years ago? It's just, you know, they got that same table setting up on the same block and haven't really, you know, switched up, haven't expanded. Um, to their members haven't changed their uh, their way of thinking or how the thinking applies to their action and things like that. And also, is there a process for change for people? I think that a revolutionary organization both has to be changing um, not only with the times, but in, you know, in response to the terrain, and it has to have some sort of uh, process for people to be changed through engaging. You know, again, just to use myself as an example, since we hear, um, you know, having a process for someone to come to an organization and be one way and be able to transform into a committed person, whether that that, that person becomes a, a PE leader or you know just a, another a, a member who pulls up to um, their responsibilities, whatever they may be. So that's that a process for, or a plan for at least uh, those things to be, to be a revolutionary organization. And I will say back to the humility thing, again, if it's a revolutionary org, they are interested and invested in criticism, both self-criticism and overall, and that means that you have something to offer, even if it's just questions, even if you have, you know, uh, a misunderstanding of what revolution is, that organization has something to gain by being able to clarify it to you and having having it clarified through their propaganda, through their political education process, whatever it is. So thinking about culture, you know, uh, what would you say is the importance of culture uh, in developing revolution so i would say that culture is how a society reinforces or re reiterates itself um so that being the case if you understand revolution as a, a complete transformation of society we are building up a counterculture to the point where it can replace the culture um the social political and economic system that exists now going from capitalism to socialism and that means that we have to be building that up right now if we understand that this stuff happens you know there will be no just randomized though it may be spontaneous it won't be a randomized revolution if we are unprepared um our counterculture of being committed people of being collective people of being uh people who study history um who apply it to our terrain uh, folks who are who are loving, who are caring, you know what I mean? Uh, we have to start being those people right now and creating that culture so that it can start to build because if it does not uh, start somewhere that we don't, you know, we don't build the thing at all, it can't, it can't really grow. And so culture is a, a huge part of it, though it's not the entire thing in a revolutionary struggle. It's uh, the creation of alter identities and also an analysis and a war of this identity that we've been um uh, subject to this colonized identity. So it's starting with the uh, becoming new people so that we can build out um, new systems at the same time. Because we can't build a new system if we, we have the same old same old people. You know, as, as good as we could call it, as uh, egalitarian as we might throw a name at it, if we the same old exploitative, individualistic, um, you know, materialistic kind of people, then we won't end up in the same spot even if it looks different at first. So culture is super important because we have to start reiterating, start to build, start to reinforce the alternative that carries us through both the social, political, and economic uh, revolutionary struggle and transformation. Through that, as we talk about this transformation, I think it falls at a very um, timely situation uh, in this so-called nation of the United States of America, where the election year is upon us. And many of us will be um, misled and uh, participation in democracy will be um, created for the masses. And so, you know, what are your thoughts 
on their electoral process, you know, specifically around the presidency? Uh, and what role have you seen it play in establishing democracy in this country? Hmm. I would say when I think about this question, I think about uh, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization and that um, how they understood and started to clarify Black power. It was like, you know, take, taking over a system. And I think what can be learned about what elections mean or don't mean and how they're engaged in here, uh, we can look at what they went through there. And so the start of this, this process, the organizing that they were doing down there, it wasn't let's start propping up these individuals. It was a mass education um, campaign. And so like, this is what these people do. This is what the system is, what it does. Um, and a changing of a campaign based on the fact that most of those folks were illiterate. And so they had to come at it from a certain perspective. This isn't to big up electoral processes, but to say, like, looking at now, how many of us can really articulate what, what any of these people who are running for any sort of office are about? And I think that's a, a note of our uh, uh, political underdevelopment. Um, never never Trump. Process, you know? <laughs> never Trump. Get rid of Trump, man. <laughs> Right. Well, while, while his uh, the person that replaced him building up the wall now, but you know it's crickets on that front. Um, but yeah, the the way that the, these processes um, play out is really just to to engage people in um, feeling like they have contributed to to a society that is constantly taking from them without any feeling like we're we're doing something with elections. I think that we would be outside a lot more often. But you know we it's really the most effective reform tool because it's already set up to take two years or four years. And so there's this like take action and then wait kind of campaign that's uh, that's pushed off on people. The way that it's been used to um, take away democracy, to like give the facade of democracy is to, again, take all of our energy away from organizing to propping up campaigns to paying attention to hour long debates uh, again, to you know, just waiting. Once people get in office, oh, they need four more years, or we just need to wait and see, and all this other stuff. While you know, these these presidents get more and more evil um, as the as the days go on, and more and more effective. Which I think is partially due to us turning away from them and not really paying attention to what's happening in the world, our inability to challenge what's happening on a national or global scale. Yeah. So you know as it pertains to eradicating exploitation and capitalist imperialist oppression, uh, do you see, you know, uh, organizations that might identify as revolutionary backing presidential cam candidates like uh, this person named Cornell West uh, as part of the process? I'll say what confuses me about that is just the, some questions to ask. What is the the base that Cornell West is responsible to? Who was it that said, you know what, in order for us to be effective, we need you to to jump out as president? Should he, you know, win a presidency or whatever? Who is what is the group that's going to hold him any sort of accountable? And also, what does it mean to be president? You know, and just some some questions to ask. I think in terms of eradicating oppression. I'm skeptical of anybody who takes uh, a podium, a platform, and does not tell people to organize. That's that's a very basic red flag for me. So anybody that gets on the stage and says they people just need to love each other, or they say people just need to vote, I see those as as, as similar evils, and that you have the ability to tell people uh, to be leading people down a a road to solving their own problems rather than waiting for you to ascend to a to a platform. Uh, engaging in supporting a, a, a national engaging in supporting a president of the so-called United States in terms of eradicating oppression and solving conditions is strange and I think that it mm -hmm. I, I can mm -hmm. let, me, let me be careful <laughs> strange <laughs> <laughs> I would say that it that it's strange, and again, I question <laughs> what people are doing. You know, what is what is the program? Because here, you know, we could say not just the things that we're writing, but the actions that we're taking might necessarily be in contradiction to engaging our time in something like that. But if a and person tells folks, you they're committed to ending capitalism 
and establishing pan-Africanism or communism, what part of the dialectic is elect the electoral process? Would that be considered part of it? This electoral process, nah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, like, again, yeah. it comes back to what's, what's, what's missing. Like this is a, at the very least, we could say this is a, a premature step. You know, at the very most, we could say this is a, a contradiction to people's politics or any sort of belief in a mass based anything. I don't understand. Again, coming back to the question of who are you representing? How can you have a mass talk about the masses and, and the people and all that? And the folks really don't know what your presidency or what your what your representation would mean for them or mean to them. It's a, a oh, what have you done for them over the last, you know, 40 years? How have Back. you been? A, how have you been a, a beacon of representation for them? How have you worked mm -hmm. to meet their material needs? How have you worked to build uh, your anti-capitalist, your anti-fascist? How have you worked to destroy the empire to present day? Come on, that's where on. for me, you know, those are the type of questions we got to ask. What program? And what movements you have you supported? Yeah. <laughs> you know, or is it just photo ops getting arrested? Mm -hmm. What organization has been developed? <laughs> very tricky times we're living in, man. And, strange. You know, very strange. I like that. I'm about to start using that. You know, that's some strange shit. <laughs> y'all got some <laughs> strange shit going on. <laughs> I don't know, like man. Like strange pretty, shit y'all got going it's, on. It's, it's very strange. That might be the episode title. <laughs> strange shit going on with Darius. <laughs> it's really strange. <laughs> but, yeah. We got we to, gotta, you know. Always provide clarity in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We can't be stuck in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. It's 2023, and we have to have a analysis that reflects that. As much as you do have to give things time to pan out, you don't have to ignore the objective reality that's been presented to you through history or even in contemporary times. You know, like, okay, historically, they haven't done anything. Or historically, this is how they've combated the empire or lack thereof. Uh, contemporary, this is what they're saying. Like, I mean... All of us know how to play odds, you know? I mean, we're scientists. Mm -hmm. yeah. we Even the best, you know? We understand <laughs> the current, and we use that as a guiding way to make a prediction and hypothesize yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen on. next. <laughs> yeah, it's an important question, besides, you know, taking a podium and a platform. But I think e even that, like a lot of us don't even understand that there can be something built. But that's such an important question. What have you built? You know, you've been around this long where where are you know what is the where, what are your wins you know what i mean besides the personal you know scuffles here and there with institutions that you've had where you know you may have been called out for your stances you know what qualifies you to be able to say you, you can uh build this, this thing you i mean but even for us even you know uh mm. Because you get some people who have done things historically who can point to actual historical wins right who say like, I, mm -hmm. i've done this i've supported these movements uh, but it's like, OK, in the last, let's say, decade, what have you done to combat if you're saying I'm going to uh, I'm here to put it into the Western European, Resto Euro, Western Euro American Empire? OK, what have you mm -hmm. done to combat that the last 10 years? How have you combated Africa? Mm -hmm. How have you combated uh, the war in Iraq and the sanctions on Iran in the middle of the rest of the Middle East? How have you combated uh, the embargo on Cuba, right? Mm -hmm. What would how have you fought to free Palestine over the last decade, and why the sudden change? Or if you hadn't, what 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 was the catalyst for your sudden change of heart? What is your mm -hmm. catalyst to think an America can be saved? What is your <laughs> catalyst to run for the United States of America to become the commander in chief? What is? And even if the even if I mean Darius made a point earlier, right? Like okay. Sometimes the people don't because their time is already arrested as a result of capitalism, of, of the uh, economic system of capitalism that designs your 24 hour day for you. Whether you feel like you have some freedom, you really don't. Right. Your time is already arrested. So most people don't really, really have the time nor capacity to ask these questions. Uh, anyone who is dedicated to actually leading the people and wanting the people to participate in their ability to uh one of the people to have clarity and understanding so that they can fully participate in their ability to contribute to a so-called nation. They should be giving these people the answers without them even having to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. You should be presenting like, okay, this is what I've done. This is my plan. This is how I've attacked these things over the last 10 years. Not just, uh, you know, use the buzzwords and play on people's emotions. And that's the sickest thing about this misleadership class. And that's why I think mm -hmm. they're going to hell because they play on people's emotions straight up. <laughs>
<laughs> straight up they 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 attack vulnerable people and the masses is vulnerable people because the uh, the masses uh don't have health care the masses don't have access to uh healthy foods the masses are on employment you know it's predatory and parasitic it's devilish mm-hmm. especially because they understand exactly what's going on and exactly what they're satanic doing. By definition, I mean, I, I would consider it satanic. You know? <laughs> By so, definition, that's why I say they're going to hell. You Peace. pointed to uh, <laughs> that's why I say they're going to hell. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you pointed to like the responsibility of uh, orgs who, who are uh, clarifying themselves and trying to be uh, leadership, and I think it just comes back again to having the alternative, having something else for people to spend their time doing. Because again, if you don't have a program, a platform, a plan. Um, you can look at what Cornell West is doing and say, well, shit, at least he's doing something. You know, all things, a whole host of shit gets termed as, you know, positive or as like what could be um, in in the long run a good thing if we don't have any sort of other thing that we're doing, other things. So like having a, a material program that you're engaged in not only allows for yourself to look at like what should we be spending our time doing, but also when you're talking to other folks, like, okay, they're doing that thing over there again tomorrow, you know, niggas are still going to be hungry. So what are we, you know, what are we doing to, you know, materially change the thing and being able to point folks, not just away from what they doing over there, that puppet show, but to bring them back to the thing here. And like, here is what we, where we should be spending our time. Yeah. Well, y'all don't got to worry about us over here at Hello Black and giving Cornell West a, a platform. He, he's boycotted. <laughs> we boycott Zionists. Yeah. Uh, we boycott neoliberalism, but, uh, Appreciate you joining us today, bro. I thoroughly enjoyed this. No doubt. Appreciate y'all for having me. You're a good conversationist, bro. You got a future in this. <laughs> oh, wow. All those years of poetry Thank have you. paid off. <laughs> <laughs> nah, real shit. That's my resume. Serious. <laughs>